Welcome to the Rock and Life podcast, Rock and Life After Divorce. And today we have Michael Rhodes here today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That is so awesome. I love interviewing people. This is uh, one of my passions in my life become, you know, the last six months. And uh, yeah, me too. The, the Rock and Life podcast is all about bringing hope to people that are struggling through divorce and uh, being this uh, light in the end of the tunnel, giving little clues on on what to do and what not to do when you navigate this difficult journey. And um, I've gotten so many new good friends through this mm. interview process, and it's it's a lot of fun. And uh, Michael, you are also a podcast host. Your podcast called the Rising Phoenix Podcast. And uh, you have a passion to help men recover from divorce. That is my passion as well. And your goal is to help men give them hope a place to come together and work together in order to rise up from the ashes of their former lives. That is an awesome passion and, and vision. I think that's so, so cool. And I usually start the podcast by just uh, give a little teaser about what we're going to talk about in this podcast. Yeah, I think part of the, the journey, once you are served papers or a separation occurs, part of that journey is trying to find not only meeting, but it's about, I think for me, uh, and I think it's the wisest path is to do some pretty deep introspection. And, and I did that. I still do that. And one of the things that I, I discovered was that my deployment of the silent treatment was not a healthy thing, not only for me, because I was avoiding things, but also for my uh, soon to be ex-wife, because she was a pretty codependent person. And I'm not saying that to knock her. We all have our faults and failures. We're, we're humans, but it was especially painful to her because of that. And it, it made her feel isolated and uh, alone at times. And that was never my intent, but that's what I've learned is that's what has occurred. And it was probably, not probably, it was a, a, a contributing factor to our divorce, for sure. You're going to dive into that a little bit more about how that can affect the relationship. I did a lot of self-reflection myself. You know, how did this happen? And the problem is if you go into a new relationship right after a divorce, you're going to very large percentage end up in divorce again. It's so important to do that self-reflection and figure and, and think, you know, what did I do? How did I contribute? How can I can like do this journey? Yeah, that, that's an important part of it. So for me. The divorce process started in July of 2019. We were on vacation actually in Rome, Italy. And uh, we, we actually, we went on a cruise around, we hit all the Greek Isles or at least the big ones. I don't know how many there are, but we, we went, on, went on a cruise around the Greek Isles and then we spent three days in Rome. And on that last day before heading into the Sistine Chapel, uh, I was told she probably wanted a divorce. I, you know, of course I was devastated, taken aback confused. I mean, we had issues. There's obviously nuance to the story, but you know, I won't cover, but it was, uh, it was a shock in some ways. And, and in some ways it wasn't just because I, you know, we were having issues. I guess I, I was just surprised that she was willing to walk away and that's essentially what happened. So we got back home on July 3rd of, uh, of 2019 and one or two days later, she moved out. She, she went to live with her parents. I suspect some infidelity. There was definitely another person involved. And that's the nuance of the story that I won't get into, but uh, I knew the man. And I don't know if she ever actually cheated per se, but I suspect it, but it's water on the bridge at this point. It doesn't really matter. But she left the two children here with me. And that was the most difficult thing I have ever done in my life is try to console and help two children understand why mommy left. I don't wish that upon anyone. I think that I don't know how anyone does that, let alone a mother, but that's, that's her burden to bear. I, I can't try to understand it or worry about how it's going to affect her. Uh, I do frequently worry about how all of this is going to affect my children and I'm trying my best to do my best for them. And with that said, I also have to protect myself and keep myself sort of safe. So I don't have a lot of interaction with their mother. I mean, none in person. 
it's all via the the court ordered app. I have a significant amount of, of anger, which is, you know, hurt and pain. Anger just covers it up where as men, we're, we're, we're allowed to be angry, but usually that anger is covering a, a deeper, more painful emotion. And I'm in the process and, and have been, and will continue to be probably for the rest of my life to work through these things and figure out how to handle them in a way that is healthy, not only for me, but also for my children. That's uh, definitely one of the most difficult things I've ever gone through in my whole life. Yeah, it's devastating. A shock for the system and uh, definitely to navigate that in a positive way, taking the right step. Because when you're acting in anger, you're not yourself. And right. a lot of times you make stupid mistakes. Oh yeah. I usually say one of the keys to move through divorce in a good way is to have people around you. Uh, to isolate yourself is very common, but that's one of the biggest mistakes you can do is to isolate yourself. It can be years after. A lot of people isolate themselves and they just uh, become this uh, downward spiral and uh, they don't get out of it. But to reach out for help, and I think men has a harder time with asking for help too. It's a lot of pride involved. Yep. And uh, it seems like you have come over that bump and you're seeking help. You're introspect, you're thinking and learning. So how did you move through this? Have you asked for help and what are your best suggestions? I, I had a difficult childhood and I also lost my father when I was 22. My father was my biggest supporter and my, one of my best friends. And he was 44 when he passed and I, I was devastated. I was angry. I was sad. I was bitter. I was I was a mess. I was also in, in the United States Navy at the time. And I was fortunate that I had, I had a chief that was looking out for me and, and said, you need to get into some counseling. And so I went through the Navy and I got a counselor and I sort of began my self-help journey at that point. And, and I had a lot of stuff that I think we all do because we're raised by humans and they're fallible. And so even with the best of intentions, our parents are going to screw up. Even with my best of intentions, I know I have screwed up. So we all have things to work through, but I had a lot of things to work through and it really began at that point. And so asking for help became a little bit easier because I legitimately, it was, it wasn't like a, you know, when someone dies, uh, you're not usually told, yeah, just get over it. Just move on. It's fine. You know, when you, when you go through a divorce or a breakup, that's pretty much the norm from a lot of people, you yeah. know, just, just, just get over it. Just move on. It's fine. <clears throat> so I think if I hadn't gone through the loss of my father, which felt like a legitimate reason to ask for help, I don't know that I would have quite frankly have asked for help later on in life, because as you said, as, especially as men, there's a stigma about asking for help. There's a stigma about therapy. There's a stigma about having emotions and feelings. And, and that's one of the things that I, I try to break down and sort of dismantle is that sort of view that men can't cry, men can't ask for help, men can't have any emotions other than anger. So my self-help journey sort of started there. And, and once the divorce happened, it became much easier for me to ask for help. And so, and it's kind of funny, I, I have a, a, a great friend of mine, he's a a mentor, a brother, he and I met probably 2005 or so. And the first night I met him, I met him through, it's a long story. I won't get into that, but I met him through, through a mutual friend, a long, a long way around. And the first night I met the man, we started talking about his divorce from the first meeting of, of meeting this, this guy, I, I knew what he was going through. Now at the time I was happily married. You know, and he was five or six years out from the divorce. So it was very strange. I don't have much faith. Uh, I try, uh, but I struggle with it. But those types of moments make me sort of my ears and my, my intuition perks up and go, well, maybe there is something to this faith thing. But if it wasn't been for him having this conversation with me the first time we met, I wouldn't have known that he was going to be a resource. And so, and we were friends, we were friendly, uh, but we didn't talk on the phone very often. You know, we would definitely see each other. I would definitely go to his place and, you know, we would hang out and stuff, but he wasn't a super, super close friend, but I knew his story. So once I was starting to go through my journey, I knew that he was a resource and I reached out to him. So that's one of the keys is the action of reaching out, the action of putting your hand up and saying, I need help. And if I hadn't 
had all these other things happen, I probably wouldn't have so easily done it. And more importantly, perhaps I wouldn't have known that he was a resource, not just somebody putting your hand up and asking somebody to help you. But I knew I had a friend that I could lean on and that became sort of the center of what I tried to do going forward and not only work on myself, but I knew the importance of being able to, to rely on a friend or I should say a man to help me with these things. So once I got to a certain point in my recovery and I, and I truly believe going through a divorce is a recovery. It's not just getting over it. You have to recover from it. Yes. I knew that I, I wanted to be the, the same type of resource to other men as much as I could be, as much as I can be as myself still recovering. Yeah. And I think it's so awesome that you share that because, uh, when somebody like that opens up, that's a sensitive issue. That's a yeah. sensitive subject. And, and guys, a lot of times don't talk about feelings and, and hurts and, uh, that made it safe for you to reach out to him because he shared something difficult with you. As with that. Same thing for me. I had a friend of mine that opened up. He had severe anxiety. We were just sitting in a restaurant. We just got them to know each other six months and him sharing about his anxiety. I had no idea what he was dealing with. Yeah. And then I shared about my divorce and our friendship deepened, you know, now we're best friends. Just taking that step of faith and reaching out and say, you know, I am vulnerable. I'm, I'm okay to share things that hurt. And a lot of guys are probably a little bit afraid of taking that step because they're wondering what am I going to look like? Am I going to look right weak when I share yes. that or whatever? Yep. But, uh, I had such a lot of shame go through divorce. It felt like a failure. I was yep. married for 20 years and I didn't want to talk to the, the, the cl my closest people about the divorce. It was really difficult to start sharing about it. It's not just sharing with those that are close to you that can be difficult. Sharing with anyone can be difficult, but I think there is something to be said for sharing with someone who understands. If you have a great friend, but he's never been through a divorce, he's not going to be able to help you as much as someone who has been through it. I think it's vital to seek out support. I mean, any support is great. And I'm not knocking those people because they haven't gone through a divorce. Good for them. But they just don't get it as much. They don't understand that kind of a pain and rejection. So it for me, that's why I, I look at this as an opportunity. If I'm able to take this pain and, and suffering and turn it into a strength and uh, allow other men to, to help them, it gives it meaning, it makes it sort of worthwhile. Yeah, it's definitely, I usually say that you, you need to pick people that you trust. Yeah. And it was actually my counselor because I, I went through so much loneliness, depression throughout the initially in the divorce. And she said, reach out to a few people that you trust. And I reached out to four people, two of them had gone through divorce and they're the one that I felt that they could relate to me. The other people listened, the other two sure. listened, but I never felt that we could really connect. And I didn't feel that they could understand me. And to be able to talk to somebody about what your hurts is so important, yeah. but it's also important to have, for example, a mentor, uh, yes. somebody that's already moved through it. These two people have just recently gone through it. And it's kind of like when you have two people struggling, yeah, they can listen, but they might not be able to help as much. Right. Have somebody that's moved through it a long time ago and be like a mentor and a coach or, you know, somebody that can uh, give you some hints about the future is also a, a, a crucial point to it. And that's why you have mentorships, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, to have those people around you is so crucial. Well, and that's one of the things I think that is also difficult with men is that, and, and, and maybe women too, but uh, for sure, men, I think, and again, why it, it makes me, uh, I just love my buddy, Chris, because from what I have seen in working in support groups and trying to help men and interviewing people. And it seems like a lot of men, once they get to a certain point, they don't want to look back. They don't want to talk about a divorce. They just want to move forward. So that's one of my missions is to find men that are willing to say, Hey, yep, I've been through it and it, you're going to be okay. I think that's harder to find, uh, because I think once men get to a certain point, they don't, they just don't want to look back. 
And so it becomes harder for us to find examples of success, of getting through it and getting over it because people don't want to talk about it because they just want to leave it in the past. And I totally respect and understand and get that. But that's why part of my mission is to find men that have successfully navigated it and are able to share that, yes, you will be okay. Here's some of the things that I did. Try these. That's definitely part of the mission. And it, it can be challenging at times. Yeah. So that comes into one of the questions I have, uh, what you've learned about yourself and uh, that you didn't know, or maybe you're just kind of like starting to rediscover it. And that's silent treatment and how that affected you and your relationship. And also, how are you dealing with that now? I can't remember the moment and or why. It was probably a book. I, I read a lot. At some point, I learned how devastating the silent treatment is to the other half. I never looked at it as, not necessarily as a punishment to the other person, a, a bit of that, if I'm being honest, but more protection. Like you're, you, you said something that hurt me, so I'm, I'm turning you off, so you can't hurt me anymore. Now, did I say any of that? No. So they didn't even know my motivations. To them, it was, to my ex, it was probably just some cruel punishment. I didn't look at it that way. And I don't remember what point or what book, but at some point I learned that that is not healthy. Excuse me. It's a stressful thing to even think about. You can't, you can't do that to people. If you're going to be in a relationship, that's not fair. It's not uh, appropriate. Whatever uh, you know, adjective you want to use, it just wasn't the right thing to do. And so now I can't say that I'm cured. <laughs> and, and part of this, I think a lot of this stuff that you, you realize your, some of your faults, you try and work on them. And, and, and step one is just being conscious of them. So that's great. I'm, I'm aware now. But some of these things that you, you can't know where you'll be in a relationship until you're in a relationship. So there's some stuff that I'm, I'm not sure where I am in terms of being quote unquote better or improved or growth. I, I, I don't know, but I am now really starting to push myself and that's very, very gentle and very, very baby step like, but I'm starting to push myself to deal with things that are uncomfortable, to have uncomfortable conversations. Uh, because right now I don't have conversations with my ex in, in like face to face. It's all, like I said, it's all via an app. So I'm trying to, to push myself because right now I'm silent treating her now. And, but again, it's for my protection, not necessarily for her punishment, but I have to get away from that. I, if I'm going to grow from this, I have to push into these uncomfortable spaces and try and as gently as I can force myself to face things because I think essentially what silent treatment is, was for me anyhow, is avoid. I just didn't want to avoid it. If I just didn't, if I didn't deal with it, it didn't exist. And so I'm trying my best to, to push myself to, to take on, uh, or to, to deal with things that I really don't want to deal with. And, and it, it's a challenge it, and it will be a challenge probably for, for a long time, but it's one I'm aware of. It's one I know I have to, to deal with. And it's one that is, it's important to me for sure. I think it's uh, crucial uh, to be, become aware of those things that yes. figures you or that uh, you use as a, a protection. And, uh, that's a key to, to find that out and also to try to research and try to figure out yep. how do I react in kind of like stressful situations yes. and yep. uh, how can I become better handling those type of situations? And yep. courage is a big, big, big part of that to take uh, the step, you know, yep. baby steps, but taking those steps and putting yourself in, in those type of situations and dealing with them. Yeah. And it's not about, you know, jumping in the deep end, you know, it is really about putting your toe in the water, you know? Yes, maybe you want to eventually dive into the deep end, but you, you got to start small. You got to be gentle with yourself. And also when you do these things, when you make these steps, no matter how small they are, you got to celebrate them. You have to take the time to stop and go, all right, well, I did. Okay, that's great. Now you can't rest there, but you at least have to acknowledge your efforts and 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 be gentle with yourself. You know, one of the things that I, I think about a lot is negative self-talk and how we're essentially programmed species to look for the negative. That's how we survived and made it to this far. You know, a long time ago, it was making sure that we didn't get our throats ripped out by, you know, wild animals, but 
you know, now we, we don't have that issue, but that sort of looking for the negative still, it sticks with us. So we have to be very, very mindful of how we think and what we think about and to be, to be gentle with ourselves and realize when we are having these negative things to sort of redirect them and change your thoughts. But that takes time and effort and any gains you have, I think it's incredibly important to stop, breathe in the victory, no matter how small, because it allows us to, it, it's sort of a positive feedback loop. So we did something good. We recognize it in ourselves. We celebrate it. It, it, it encourages us to push a little further. But again, this, it, you know, toes in the water, it's very slow process. I tell guys all the time, there is no timetable. Whatever timetable you think, throw it out the window. It doesn't yeah. matter. And I struggle with it. You know, Chris reminded me yesterday. He's like, remember, you tell the guys all the time and here you are saying, yep, you're right. I should be here. Definitely be careful with should statements. I should have done this. I should be here. I should do that. Those type of statements can be damaged. Getting people around you is uh, definitely a key to moving faster and also to create this upward spiral instead of the downward spiral. Now, when it comes to the silent treatment, has that affected you in any, any other relationships, uh, for example, friends or uh, your kids, et cetera? And how have you dealt with that? Uh, I'm trying to think of, with friends. Yeah, definitely. Y you know, I don't know that I, it's, it's definitely not deployed in the same type of way that it would be in a relationship, but I would say instead of sort of, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but it's very similar. I would just avoid someone. Like if I'm kind of dealing with it now, to be honest with you, there's a guy who, uh, was a friend is a friend and, and he's done some things that have been hurtful and, and disappointing and, and I've talked with him, but not about the issues. And so I've been, again, I've been, you know, I've been avoiding it. And that's sort of a silent treatment. Also called it the boundary. Uh, if somebody doesn't treat you correctly, then you have to have boundaries, which is very, very healthy. And that also brings respect. Sure. I have respect between the friendship. If somebody steps over a boundary that you have or call your name or whatever. Sure. And you tell them, okay, this didn't feel good. And then if they still overstep it again, you're going to have yeah. to enforce that boundary. I think the, the key there is to, and, and where I fail is to make it known that they have crashed up against a boundary that pushed up against the boundary. I'm, I'm not good at stating that like, Hey, yeah. this I'll just withdraw. And so I'm yeah. trying to put myself in the uncomfortable of saying to him and it sits on my to-do list. It's Definitely. It can be a little uncomfortable to say yes. somebody that has hurt you. Absolutely. This really hurt. Can you please not say that to me again? Yes. This, it, I don't like that. And then, yeah. you know, if this happens again, I'm not going to be able to have a friendship with you to establish those boundaries. It's so crucial. Yeah, agreed. And it's, it's the, that's the difficult part for me is just to have those to sort of, because uh, I think it's a fear of rejection, right? Yeah. Even though I'm hurt by him, if I say, hey, man, I didn't like that. And he says, well, F you, I don't care. That's what I'm uh, trying to avoid. But meanwhile, who knows if that's what he's going to say? I don't even know. So it's, it's a matter of pushing myself into these uncomfortable spaces in order to make peace with them and get over them. And, and you'll never, ever grow or overcome anything if you don't push yourself into some uncomfortable space. And you don't really want to have people in your life that treats you poorly. You need to have uh, boundaries and you need to have people, you know, check marks, you know, this is, this is an awesome person, but that person, you know, I don't really like to have that person in my life. Yep. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. When you moved through the divorce and, uh, not up until now, have you learned something about yourself other than the silent treatment or how has this divorce impacted your life? An example for me, if I was not very open and vulnerable. I was very much trying to pretend to have my, my relationship in order, having a nice house, you know, et cetera. A lot of these things going through a divorce financially crushed me, not being dependent on these outside physical uh, objects and also to be able to be me, to be able to kind of say what I think. It's one of the biggest learnings in my life. And I love being me. I love to be able to be, you know, say what I think and being vulnerable and open. It's really fueled my desire to grow and to improve. I have found myself going, okay, this is not fun. This is not good, but what can I do now? And what options do I have? And, and the best one, the biggest one is to be truthful, to speak my truth 
but also in that to find areas of growth and opportunity for me as an individual, as an emotional man, what are the things that I can do to, to improve? And, and, and I've, I've learned that it's, it's not a destination. It is a journey. You're never yeah. going to get there. Uh, there is no perfection. Perfection is not the goal. Progress is. And so that's really been a central part of, of who I am. You know, I've done different courses with life coaches. I've went back to school. I've really tried to as gently and best I can find my flaws and try and improve upon them. Not that I'm a flawed person. I just have flaws. I'm a human when we all have them. And so I've, I've really embraced the flaws within me because they're a part of who I am, but I've also tried to find ways to strengthen and rise up, um, above my flaws that were really developed because of shitty parents or, or at least human parents, they did the best they could. Their best was kind of not very good, but now I have the opportunity. Now I have the power to determine what type of person I am. And so that's really been a focus of my life since, you know, I don't, I don't know what, at what point, probably six months, maybe after she left at some point I just said, okay, it's, it's on you now. Um, yes, what she did was wrong, but you had contributing factors, but that aside is water under the bridge. There's no going back. What can you do now? Yeah. And the only thing I can do is, is focus on myself. And, and it's not always easy. It's not always fun. It's definitely not fun sometimes, but it is fruitful and it is the best way forward because that's the only way forward, really. We're the only healthy way. And that's also, I come back to having people around you, why it's yeah. so crucial because this is a journey. You're navigating it and you're going to have times when you feel you know, really down and we're going to get into suicide and to have those people around you when you go into a l- little bit of a dip in this journey, then it, you really need to have people around you. I've heard pretty much every single person I've interviewed, not everyone, but most people, they've had suicidal thoughts. And uh, I wanted you to share a little bit about uh, men's suicide and also your support group, how you started that. Yeah. So I was definitely suicidal. I had a plan. I was going to, I live at the bottom of a, of a little bit of a hill and it's a main road and there are, you know, 18 wheelers, dump trucks that come by pretty frequently. And I was going to go outside and I was just going to walk in front of the biggest, fastest one that was coming. Um, I checked myself into a hospital and got a psychiatrist and got on medication. And I, I know the pain. And if there's anyone out there listening and you think that you're alone and that you're the only one that's ever dealt with this and the pain of it. I promise you that's not the case. And I, I sympathize and I understand in 2019 in America alone, divorced men killed themselves at a rate of 38 a day. Uh, That's crazy. And that number is staggering. Um, and so one of the, one of the keys to, to lowering that, I believe is to reduce the stigma of, of men feeling and crying. And so after I had help from my buddy, Chris, who I mentioned, um, and I will continue to mention, I love the man. Um, I've realized pretty quickly that he was one of the main reasons that I was still alive. Wow. And I thought to myself, how do I pay that forward? What can I do? I have all this pain, I have all this hurt. I have all this misery. I have all this time. What can I do with this besides working on myself and focusing on myself is I can help other men. And so I thought, well, I I'll be a life coach. And I thought that's something I can focus on, something I, I can do. I went to school to do that. Then, then I thought, and I went to, uh, John Kim, the angry therapist. He has a book, a couple of books. One is, uh, yeah, I used to be a miserable fuck. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. I went to his school, uh, journey. Uh, J R N I, uh, it's a life coaching school. I went through it and I thought, and John's a great guy. I'm fortunate enough to, to, I had him on the podcast. I've, I've spoken to him many times. He's a great human being and he's another one who's an example. He went through the same thing. He went through a divorce and it propelled him to where he's at now. So I went through that life coaching school and I thought to myself, okay, well, who am I? Like, why would anyone pick me to be their life coach? And I thought, how can I get my name out there? I thought, I'm going to start a podcast because I didn't, I didn't see many for, for men. I didn't see anything that 
was sort of rang true to me. So I thought, well, I'll start a podcast. I should start a support group too for guys that are going to listen because the, the goal of the podcast was to be a resource and, and to provide info and, and help and guidance to men. And so I started a support group and I, it, it has grown and I'm, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the men in it. And in, in that process of creating this community, I started to think, I don't think I want to be a life coach, at least not yet. And at least not to these men, because man, there are guys coming in and I remember how vulnerable and hurt I was. And there were guys coming in the support group, guys that have, you know, found the podcast and been like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Thank you so much. I thought to myself, I mean, I'm in sales. I'm a sales guy. I thought to myself, I can't sell to these guys. That just, it feels weird to me. So uh, I sort of abandoned that idea and decided that I was just going to build out the network and partner with people and make it sort of a separate yet equal part of what I'm doing. So in, in the next few months, I'll be launching another website where if you want a life coach, a financial advisor or whatever, if they are interested in finding someone to support them in that kind of a way, then they can, they have a resource. They can go to the website and they can, they can find somebody. Um, so the, the support group and the podcast had a different purpose than it has now. And it, it's evolved. And that's, that's also part of the mindset that you have to take is things will, will grow and change and you have to embrace those things. You have to almost look for them and figure out and don't settle and, and don't, and don't, you know, whatever ideas you have, you're, you're allowed to change them. Whatever things you used to think you liked, you don't have to like anymore. Whatever things you weren't allowed to do with an ex, you, you can now do those. Like you have to be open in all ways. I think that's a critical key and component of of recovery is to, to be open to finding yourself, to finding ways to change, to just, to try and create a new life from the ashes of your old. And you can't do that if you're not, if you don't have an open mind and aren't willing to, to explore yourself and other things. And so that's critically important, I believe. Yeah, I totally agree. One thing when it comes to just a quick, uh, um, comment about uh, charging for services. I've been in sales my whole life myself. I usually say that if you pay, you pay attention. I think it's crucial to uh, free advice is free advice. Yes. Uh, I think it's very important to be uh, like when you do a sales, you sell in uh, something that I believe that will help the other person. It needs to be a yep. win in situation, but absolutely, it's also uh, very crucial to have a monetary, um, it, it becomes much more important for the person if you pay for it. And I think a lot of men hesitate to get help too. So sometimes they need to be encouraged to uh, get help and that's through the sales process. So that's uh, just a little different view or angle of. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, guys that are six months, I don't know what timetable, but if they're further out and they're not in a suicidal, vulnerable, my world has crumbled kind of state. Um, then they should be. Look, I, I went through a program called the Alpha Code and it changed my life for sure. It was a, a, an incredibly beneficial thing for me. And that's a life coach program, essentially. Um, and the founder, Justin Dolhanty, is is one of my mentors and heroes. I love the man. Should men go through and seek support, including life coaches? Absolutely. Uh, especially ones that, you know, are have a good track record. If you make that decision, like, I'm stuck and I need help, absolutely seek out some, some good life coaches, some good programs, some, some good people and vet them out. And I say this all the time about therapists, about life coaches. It, it's like dating. You don't have to settle on the first one you find, find a good one, find a, find one that fits. In the court, we actually decided on the, on the counselor right mm -hmm. there. We wrote it into the, the divorce decree and yep. uh, both uh, us as parents, but also the kids went through it. And I nice. think as, as early as you can to get help, to reach out for help. I'm going to round off this podcast here. And I have one last question for you. Sure. If you're speaking to someone that's just entered into divorce right now, he's miserable, he's lonely, sitting at home. What would your first steps be taking these baby steps like we talked about? One is find a good therapist. That's absolutely essential. And, and I almost say that's, that's sort of step one. But I think to go along with that, you also need to find a support system and I strongly believe in a support system of men that have been through it. 
And that could be, there's, there's probably, I mean, and it doesn't have to just be Ben. I went through, also went through a, a divorce care program, which uh, a lot of churches in America do. Like I said, I struggle with faith, but I, I understand the importance of it. And, and, and that was beneficial just to have a community of people that are going through it at that particular same time you are is so valuable. So those two things are critical. I know it's hard. You will survive it. I survived it. I should say I'm surviving it. And, and you will too. And I think if you can do those two things, they probably, hopefully they should give you some hope and allow you to, to recover from this. Cause it is painful. It is the worst, probably in my view, the worst thing you can probably go through in life with the exception of losing a child. I think even losing a spouse is not as difficult as this is, but I can't compare it. I don't know. I just suspect I lost my father. It's not the same, obviously as a spouse, but that was a pretty significant impact on my life. And that was not as hard as this has been, but know that there, there is hope. There is hope. I promise you that. Yeah. And taking a step every day and taking these small steps towards the recovery and not sitting at home, just locking yourself up and isolating. It's so crucial to reach out. I say that all the time. Hey, this has been so much fun, but Michael, it's such a good time to have you on the podcast, get to know you and uh, what you're doing out there. So uh, and just kudos to you. It's really, really awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. And if anyone uh, wants to check check out the podcast, it's uh, risingphoenixpodcast.com. And there's links there to the support group and to resources to help you. So thank you for having me. I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you.